My name is Sandra Sanchez Riley. Um, we uh, want to welcome the fourth year medical students rotating with us this month, and uh, we also want to welcome um, some of uh, our faculty members and guests that um, are here today. Uh, we are truly honored to have here Dr. Marion Promomo. Dr. Marion Promomo, uh, you probably agree with me, is the pioneer of hospice and palliative care in San Antonio. Dr. Marion Promomo um, graduated from the, uh, Our Lady of the Lake University and um, subsequently um, at Loyola University School of Medicine. She has had almost, almost 50 years of experience um, and I will say 20 to 30 years of experience in hospice and palliative care. And she's here to talk to us about a very special topic um, entitled Spirituality uh, as a Journey in Palliative Care. Um, we're very honored to have you, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sandra. I appreciate being here. Can you hear me all right? And uh, I, I thank you for the honor of being here and also for the uh, privilege of spending this time with you. Uh, people who are interested in palliative care, and I hope as we go along, we can uh, talk a bit about the development of palliative care in San Antonio, and uh, what is happening now and in the future, and uh, we'll go on with um, uh, this fascinating subject that has just become a subspecialty, palliative care. Now, there are two handouts going around, and uh, one, is very dear to me. It's called Op Ed. It is by Dr. Rachel Remen, and I have a feeling we'll have a stampede for her because she will be speaking on Saturday at 9 o'clock here in San Antonio at the convention center. Unfortunately, she, well, maybe fortunately, she is a part of the Women Speak organization, and the tickets are $120, but <laughs> I have a feeling that uh, Rachel probably would not mind having people come. Rachel Bremen is a um, uh, is a psychiatrist in California who is particularly interested in physicians, young physicians who have perhaps burned out or have are not happy with their way in life as their choice in medicine. She is a brilliant speaker. She, she provides meaning, and she gives one with a sense of, of value. Uh, one of the best speakers I've ever heard. So if you can get down there, 9 o'clock, you, you certainly would not be wasting your time. Uh, the other is the bibliography that I give in connection with the course. Uh, that I teach in palliative medicine here every week. And this has been in the works for uh, since 1978. So there are some things that are missing on this. I don't have uh, pediatrics on this one because basically this is for our people in geriatrics. But uh, there are the reason for giving you this is to perhaps give you an oversight of what is available out there in the field of palliative medicine, and to stress for you two people that I will be speaking about in connection with what with this talk. And the first one is on page, let's see which page she got on to, page two, Martin Buber, I and Thou. These books that I talk about here are, have been, have been said to be required reading for the human race. So, you know, this is something. I and Thou, it's not an easy book to read. It's a worthwhile book. Martin Buber's I and Thou. The second book is uh, mentioned on page, um, page, page three, no, I'm sorry, again, page two, almost at the end, Victor Frankl's Man's search for meaning, again, has been said to be required reading for the human race. If sometime you can read these two books, I think it, your soul will be very grateful. So we'll say more about these as we go along. And uh, I want to leave some time at the end for questions also. 
and comments because this is a, a new topic in medicine. Palliative medicine is something we're just beginning to deal with and the issues surrounding it are, um, are, are a little different from the usual um, tradition in medicine when it comes to medical education. The, um, actually, um, I think my, my, one of my interests, of course, well, the, oh, sorry, I'm put this back on. Yes, put it down. Where, where should I put it? I, how about here? Yep. But um, long ago, I read a quotation that put this in perspective in medicine. And that was a quote from a Dr. Jacob Bigelow, who in 1858 said, a physician's duties are to diagnose illness, to provide treatment, to initiate treatment, to, um, to uh, relieve pain, and also to provide safe passage. Well, as we look through the medical school curriculum, we're doing very well with the first three of those goals. I think we're just beginning to look at providing safe passage. But providing safe passage is a part of medicine just as the other parts, just as important as making the diagnosis and initiating treatment, uh, initiating treatment and, and providing relief of suffering. Providing safe passage is something new to us in medicine and, and I think gives a new dimension to medicine. So, uh, words were coined in 1975, rather, rather uh, many people do not know what palliative care is. I really, when they ask me, well, what is palliative care? I always say, well, it's supportive care, or it's comfort, or it's relief of suffering at the end of life. And, and then you talk about the end of life, people may shut down. They, they're not, people uh, do not really relish the talk of death, even, even those of us in medicine. But palliative care has, over the past, since 1975 actually, developed some essentials, some, some, core, uh, uh, some core goals that uh, we have identified and uh, can actually uh, have that. We can actually direct ourselves to these goals. The first one, of course, is the relief of pain and suffering. Obviously, if you're caring for a patient who is in agony, who's, who's having considerable pain, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to relieve the pain, get the patient's comfort level um, down to where the patient will listen to you. It's not always pain. It can be dyspnea. Dyspnea can be severe. Dyspnea is not always relieved by opening a window or turning on a fan. There are good measures for relieving dyspnea. Then if um, uh, once the pain is relieved, we can then go to broader aspects of this person and look at how has this person been in life Who's close to this person? Who cares whether this person is at the end of life? Have they talked about the things they need to talk about? Have they shared? Oh, is, is, there, is there a lot of unfinished business here that this patient who perhaps is close to the end of life may need to talk about with someone else? And that is the second big goal is communication. And that is getting bigger and bigger at all time at all times. Then the third major goal too is looking at ethical issues. I think uh, about a year ago uh, the country was uh, very involved with the Shivo case, and we all looked at the, the tremendous ethical issues that occurred in the Shivo case. Things such as withholding and withdrawing. Is it all right to to uh, um, uh, relinquish nutrition and hydration. What about physician-assisted dying? What about euthanasia? All these things are coming up now and need to be addressed. And then after we get through these goals, we look at a dimension of spirituality that I like to call personal growth. 
because as we go through uh, the stages, or you might say these goals, with the person, with our patient, we ourselves, we are changed ourselves in certain ways. The patient changes us just as much as we change them. And there is a true dialogue between us. And this is where we will talk about what the contribution of Martin Buber to this process. The, um, the uh, spirituality approach has been sanctioned by many universities now. Most medical schools are giving, uh, giving courses on, on uh, spirituality. Started with uh, Harvard, Herbert Benson, and uh, has spread. Patients want physicians to address their spirituality. They may not bring it up because they know we're busy and they're afraid to, to keep us any more than the five or 10 minutes allotted to us, but they want that. And if we can connect with the patient uh, on that level, you'll find that the patient has better trust in us, trusts us more as physicians, and will often open up to the issues that we need to address in order to keep that patient comfortable and, and secure. Uh, there's such a thing called the spiritual assessment. Doctors say, well, what do you mean a spiritual assessment? I have a lot of assessments to do. This is, um, uh, this is just one more thing to do. And uh, there are good issues. Basically, it's not a mysterious thing. You don't have to, if you're taking it as part of the history, call the chaplain, although later you may want to. But uh, a spiritual assessment you are really determining what is the meaning of life for this patient. What is this patient thinking about or has thought about in his life? And how does he feel about it now? And is his attitude or his purpose in life, has that been fulfilled? Now, that sounds like a big task. It's not. You can, you can just with a few moments of conversation, begin to make the connection that will solidify the relationship. It doesn't require hours, although sometimes it, it might. But just don't shy away from spiritual assessment. It's worthwhile. Now, uh, I found in um, the years that I've been in palliative care, making a lot of house calls and, and going out with hospice, uh, that uh, patients began to ask me some questions I couldn't answer. And uh, existential questions. Now, you know the term existential. You know that it actually we are now seeing spirituality and existential being uh, placed side by side. We have to hear um, the, the thoughts of how to respond to them has stayed with me lifelong. And that's part of what I want to speak with you about here today. See, I always say, I always go over time. But how to respond to something like that? The, um, there are many, many paths to meaning in a life. There are religious paths, and, and there are secular paths, and um, the one, the, the one, um, big topic, the one big um, essential difference between these, between uh, religion and spirituality, has to be recognized. A spirituality is a feeling, I, I took a few years to develop a definition on spirituality, and some of my, my students have said, yeah, they like that, but not, I haven't heard any objections, violent objections to it. But uh, what is spirituality? Spirituality, in my definition, is a feeling of unity with all that is, a connection with the inner self, and a connection with other things in life, one's humanity, one's relationships, and one's God or divine, or as one of my friends calls it, the force. A relation. Many of my patients who were not religious and resented my asking about religion 
would say, well, I don't believe in God. I'm, I'm an agnostic or I'm an atheist. I don't believe in that stuff. But there is something. So how would you say it? There, it might be, but that's a part of spirituality. Spirituality, those two words are very important. There is a feeling of unity with all that is. And there is a connection with it. Those are the two words. A feeling of unity with all that is and the connection that we experience to it. And this is where you'll see in a minute, Buber and Frankel come in. Now, um, we, might, uh, we might say something, just to summarize the, the palliative care, the goals at this point, get us back to where we were, the comfort, the, uh, uh, the communication, and the recognition of ethical issues. And um, there are several words that uh, have come to me in recognizing that and in coming to grips with the answers that I try to provide to patients who ask me those existential questions. And uh, as I discussed with a friend of mine the other day, I discovered after years of ruminating about it, um, there is such a thing as an existential maturity. After you think about this a while and you get it together and you cease judgment and you open up, you yourself become existentially mature. But to that, I, I owe that a lot to Martin Buber and to Victor Gold. Now, I might say at this point, let me tell you, Martin Buber was a <coughs> Jewish philosopher who died in 1965. He was, he, played a great part in um, the Jewish uh, religion and also in the history of his country. But what he is famous for, now the book mentioned in the bibliography is I and Thou. Don't think, you, you might think at first as I did, Thou means God. Not necessarily, it might. But what he says, I and Thou, and he's related, he's, he's pointing to dialogue instead of monologue. You know, very often when we speak, we have monologue. But true dialogue is the essence of living. And true dialogue consists in, in address and response. Someone is addressed, someone responds. And Martin Buber has a very, has a very enchanting way of, of, of talking about that. He says, in the address and response, when, say, two people meet each other, and they are open to each other, and they are genuine in their, in their speech, and they are honest, a spark occurs, and that is the essence of living. And Moment after moment of genuine address and response is the essence, the true essence of living. Now see where Buber came into that. Uh, not, not putting aside all, everything else. True essence of living is not having accomplished the goals that we have set for ourselves. The true essence of living happens in the encounter. And that's what he means by the I-thou relationship. Incidentally, he has written other books, and uh, a lot of people have written about him. And I was surprised the other day. I clicked on the Barnes and Noble because I was see how many how many are in print that I haven't read a lot. I can tell you, <laughs> but um, there were a hundred. And Barnes and Noble, Martin Buber, he wrote them, or his greatest. His greatest translator it was Maurice Friedman, who passed away a couple years ago. This is worth reading, and this book, when it was said to be required reading for the human race, is worth reading. And as far as I know, most of the bookstores have that. Now, you see how that, that helped me in understanding the human connection, address and response, 
And sometimes with your, when you're with a person, only a moment that can happen. This can happen at, at the very end of life. It does not require hours. So, going on to Viktor Frankl. Now, how, how do they, I don't know if, if Buber and Frankl ever met. I would think they had, but I'm not sure. Uh, Viktor Frankl died in 1997. Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor, and I almost met him, but I won't tell you that story. Um, he found, he went through a great deal of suffering. He lost his whole family in the concentration camps, but he survived to leave the camp and to go on to write his greatest book, which is Man's Search for Meaning. And again, Victor Frankl wrote a number of books too, and they're all good. But he showed us that, he said, he talked about his experience with the suffering, in, which was intense in, in the camp at Auschwitz. And he said, in the suffering I found meaning. And it took suffering to, to, find, to find that meaning. He, um, he said, and I can remember, I have been privileged to, I heard him in 1980 in Montreal, a powerful voice that said, I can tell you that it was through the suffering that I experienced meaning. And he said, I recognize that, that a tragedy led to a triumph. Through my experience, I triumph through tragedy. And this was his great message, that by finding meaning, even in suffering, even in the greatest of suffering, that he found a purpose in life. And that is really what we're talking about here. When we talk about helping a patient through that last journey, what we want to know as physicians, did this person have a purpose in life? and was it fulfilled? And that does not have to be a big hours and hours of dialogue. That can be done in even the short time before the patient dies. It doesn't happen all the time, but I have witnessed it. And if you have ever had that experience yourself, you will witness uh, a true grace, a true grace that you will feel that your own life has been blessed. So these two people coming together, I'm thinking more and more about it. They really, we really need to, to discuss it more, Uber and Frankel. And uh, perhaps they are somewhat coming together uh, in, uh, somewhat coming together in the most recent um, uh, advance in palliative medicine that by two physicians, Chochinov and Breitbart. Dr. Chochinov is a psychiatrist in Canada, and Breitbart is in New York, and they're fantastic. Well, they have just come up with something called dignity psychotherapy, because what they see, and what we, what we see too, those of us who, who take care of the dying patients uh, a great deal, see that it does not necessarily, their course does not necessarily go along with Kubler-Ross's stages. Yes, I think they're valid, but there's a stage called <coughs> depression in there that is often uh, not, not looked at sufficiently. And the stage of depression that does occur, and sometimes not always occurs in the dying process, but that may occur is, is not necessarily one that calls for the SSRIs. But that stage of depression includes things such as the feeling of meaninglessness, hopelessness, worthlessness. And perhaps this is one of the things that is, that is propelling people toward asking for physician-assisted dying. It is nothing that we can medicate. It is something, it is a feeling of 
my life has been has not been worthwhile. I feel worthless. Nobody cares for me. I'm not dignified. I, I'm just here, and I just as soon have somebody bump me off. Now, uh, in my attempts in the past to try to find a purpose, to try to help a patient find a purpose in life, uh, it comes back to me. There was a lady who lived outside of Boutique, and uh, she um, was um, uh, dying at the age of 30. She had a lovely home, two children, and her pain was under control. She was fine, uh, but she was very unhappy. She said, oh, I just, I just want to go. I'm, I'm so tired of living. I, I can't take pleasure in anything. And I tried to ask her, well, what, what is the, what's your life meant to you? And she said, oh, nothing much. I just do the things I'm supposed to do. And uh, then uh, I said, well, what, what do you particularly pride yourself in doing? And she said, uh, well, what do you feel good about the things you did? And she thought a while and she said, oh, I picked up stray animals. But that was kind of, that was a, a somewhat of, a, of a, um, uh, a sad situation because she was unable, as she looked within herself, she was unable to find something that was joyful, something that she was connected to a loving husband, to children. To, to the joys of life. And that is what really, that sort of feeling also is the basis for the anxiety concerning death. It's a hard sell, even in medicine, we don't want to hear about death. We, that's, I guess, the guess where we recognize it as, as being an approach by palliative care. But people are generally anxious about death. But the anxiety, if you will take that a little further, the anxiety of death is really based upon the fear of death. And if you take that a little further also, then the fear of death can also be seen as the lack of recognition that one is good, worthy, and lovable, and worthy of having lived. I think if attention um, to the anxiety of death by looking at both what Boober and Frankel said is a way of overcoming that anxiety. Because if we can get, of course this is the point of all psychotherapy, of, of people, get to people to give them a feeling that they are good, worthy, and lovable, that they do count that they are good people, that we value them, and oftentimes they see it reflected in our eyes as we care for them. They know whether or not we care about them. It can be just a glance. It can be a touch. You don't have to do anything heroic. A patient knows when you care, and that can happen in an instant, in, in just a short period of time. That itself, can give the patient a feeling of worthiness, a feeling of lovableness. And with that, somehow the magic appears that I am good, worthy, lovable. I can embrace death because I feel lovable. Now, of course, the idea is to have that feeling long before a person dies. But we're talking now about palliative care. We're talking about taking care of the dying. Often this happens in a short time, in days, moments, sometimes hours. And I can well remember the people who experience this. You can see the look on their face. And it, 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 it's, not, it's not the majority of people who die. Most people die still with anxiety of death. Psychotherapy, psych, uh, palliative care, and psychotherapy. Palliative care is a, a system by which we strive to relieve that anxiety by taking care of the patient's comfort, by taking care of communication, by looking at ethical issues, and by looking at growth of that individual and ourselves. 
And we ourselves have to have some idea of our own demons in order to be comfortable with that. So a part of the spiritual assessment that we do as physicians is also looking within ourselves, say, hey, can I handle this? And a lot of people say, no, I don't want to handle it. And not everybody, in, even in medicine, is, is comfortable with that. But the whole idea, the whole concept behind palliative care perhaps is the important goal that makes such a difference in the patient's life and in our own. And when you get down to it, I haven't followed my notes because I, I'm speaking to you with things that have happened in my heart. And perhaps planting a seed whereby you might want to pursue this further. As we look at palliative care, we see that really what we're doing is service to others. Now, a lot of people talk about service to others. And I think the, the Wayne Dyer, how many of you ever seen Wayne Dyer on television? He's, he's, he's a good one. Uh, he said something the other day that I thought was uh, really hit home. He said, he gave a list of 10 things you should do. And he said, um, um, he said, he said, want for others more than you want for yourself. That's a powerful statement. And he started his list of 10. Now, he's, he's not all that way all through the 10. Want for others more than you want for yourself. And that's the essence of service to others. You know, when I was young, starting out in medical school, I heard service to others. I didn't like it. I thought, that's being a doormat. I'm here or I'm going to be a physician. I'm not going to do that sort of thing. But service to others is, is what medicine is all about. And I have this delightful poem by Tabor that I think is so good at this point. I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I, I acted and behold, service was joy. I don't think anybody has ever said it better than to go. There are, there are a lot of jewels out there that all of a sudden bring this to your attention and put it in your heart. Now, do you see where Boomer, Frankel, or people like that with that kind of thinking have created the, the, the environment for us, have created the background that we can build on, that we can build on to get more knowledge of the essence of life, not only in the dying process, but also in the living process, because hopefully these things can be a part of the soul long before we die and make all of life a great joy. Victor Frankl was, was the um, uh, uh, person who, who gave us a lot of quotes on, on, um, uh, on terminal illness and uh, uh, was also telling us that it does not require vast amounts of time to do this. One of his quotes is, and let's see if I can, I want to quote him, I know it, but I want to quote him without, um, if I can get the words correctly. One can rise above oneself. One can grow beyond oneself, literally until one's last breath. Now, I know those of us who have been together in this, in this work of palliative care have heard me say that, and I think it's some of the greatest words Victor Frankl ever said. Those, one can rise above oneself, one can grow beyond oneself. And he says, one can stretch and grow up to the last minute. So these are people that we need to know. We need to know them better. We need to read their books and then perhaps translate that into our own lives. Now, I think we have some time left, but perhaps we could, this is, this is, this is really 
going along the path of, of existential maturity. <laughs> when, but these are worthwhile suggestions at a time in, in our, at a time uh, in our life and in our society and in our whole, uh, in, in the whole world situation in which perhaps it behooves us to give a few more thoughts on some of the values that are out there and to make them a part of our, uh, of what we believe in and what we do because what we do defines our path in life. And what we do in medicine is service, and, and as you see, service leads to joy. So, um, that's, that's difficult to follow with anything except to tell you that this is um, this is a value, <clears throat> even as we even as we grow, and not just in medicine. And medicine can can be a way of helping us to to feel to feel uh, these principles. <clears throat> it is <coughs> sorry. <coughs> The person who articulates this so well is Rachel Raymond. That's why I recommended her to you. She, she said, the soul of medicine is service. And she recognizes that these are the essential parts of medicine. Um, the, she mentions particularly that there is a difference between spiritual, um, uh, between um, between medical education and medical training. She said, training now is um, not the same as education, and that training is a matter of memorizing and um, techniques and perhaps something that is overwhelming but does not allow for education, which is education really is a a journey to the soul. And as in, in medicine, I believe that we are, we have a unique opportunity to be physicians who are, who experience the joy of life in the service that we give others. We experience, we are, we are, we are privileged to be with people who relate our story, their stories to us, and uh, their their stories are particularly illuminating. Uh, I might, if we have time. Do you have one o'clock? Yeah. I might. You might. You might want a practical example of of what I'm talking about. And usually, I tell more stories than than I have today. <laughs> but. but how does how does this experience how does it make you grow? And the, there are several cases. The one case that I think you would, might be interested in here is the case of Jerry. Jerry was a patient, um, eighty year old Jewish successful businessman who had just been diagnosed with lymphangenic carcinomatosis cancer of the lung that had spread throughout both lungs and he had complete white out. His friend, Dr. Coltman, who was head of CTRC at that point, had given him uh, radiotherapy with no result. And Jerry came home and came to hospice. Um, Dr. Coltman was, who's been really one of the pioneers too in hospice, uh, although he has not participated in the movement here, was most distressed that his, that his friend was so ill. Uh, when we saw him in hospice, he was first sitting up, fully dressed in the living room. How are you? I'm fine. I just can't breathe. Oh, I just can't breathe. Oh, all right. Well, well, we'll give you something and it'll be, it'll relieve you. 
So we gave what we usually give in, in um, hospice, we gave a small dose of morphine and uh, five milligrams every four hours and that generally is beneficial in cases of dyspnea. But Jerry's case of dyspnea was not that easily handled. Uh, there were several calls to hospice over the week. And Jerry's still short breath. Well, increased the morphine, went up to 10, went up to 20. Um, decided we'd better go see him. A week later, Jerry was in bed, unable to breathe. He said, I'm all right, I'm not having pain. I just can't breathe. Um, well, all right, well, maybe we'll add a little anti-anxiety. We'll uh, give some more raise of them. And then uh, when a patient, patient's symptom, uh, the initial symptom does, is not relieved by what you're doing, you begin to think, well, maybe there's some, uh, something else here. Maybe psychologically there's some unfinished business and problems. So we took a look at the family, and the family was fine. He, had a, he was at home with his wife, several children, a grandchild was on the way, and um, things were, were going well. Um, looking at that, then you begin to think, if the psychological situation seems pretty good, you begin to think of uh, spiritual issues. Well, as luck would have it, we, the, um, uh, Jerry's wife had a brother in New York, an Orthodox rabbi, who came down. And uh, we, we all connected together in the care of Jerry. He was, as the weeks went on, his symptoms of dyspnea were more severe. And he, and, uh, he more troublesome. He said, I can't stand this anymore. I just can't stand this anymore. Well, we tried various medications. Nothing helped. Nothing helped. At that point, I was in a conference with my colleague, our first palliative care fellow, who's here today, Dr. Malakoff. And I said, I, th I think the only thing we can do here is palliative sedation. As you know, palliative sedation is sedating a person to unconsciousness, and then frequently death will follow. This man, of course, was at the, at the end of his life. He was bedridden, he was not eating, he was at the end of his, of his cancer. Uh, but we discussed this palliative sedation for a while, and we talked about it with other people, and, and I thought, well, that seems the man was, I can just, I can hardly tell you his suffering. It was, that was not pain. But that was probably the most intense suffering I have ever seen. One felt the absolute urgency to relieve this, and that is our duty as physicians, relieve this symptom. I called it malignant dyspnea, because I can't even say just dyspnea. And so we talked about it, and then we decided to speak with the family about it. We were all on one page, the wife, the children, and the rabbi was there. And we asked, well, is this, if we do palliative sedation, is this consistent? Is this in agreement with Jewish principles? And this rabbi said, yes, indeed, it is. He said, because if you do not relieve his suffering, you are against Jewish law. And of course, that, that, that was, a, that was the, the assent that our actions were all right. We went, then I went to the patient, and I sat with him and I said, Jerry, I know you're suffering. I can relieve your suffering. We can give you something that will put you to sleep, but then death will come. Would you like us to do that? I said, you want to think about it? And Jerry just, no. He said, no. He said, I just can't stand it. So we began, we gave him, at that point, held on at a van, IV. Probably you can use other things, midazolam, there are a number of other things. And within 36 hours, Jerry died very peacefully. He lost consciousness almost immediately because he was so close to death. I, I have kept in touch with his, um, with his wife, Helen, and we have often discussed this. And, and I tell her that I tell his story to people who need to
feel what happened at that time. And to need to feel also that palliative sedation is not unethical, immoral, or unlawful. It is not euthanasia. It is simply putting the intention of relieving suffering, not killing the patient. The killing the patient is not first. Relieving suffering is first. That is the intention. And that is acceptable. So it's sometimes you may have some difficulty in, uh, in getting that straight uh, about the difference. That was a situation that I, over the years, as I look back on it, and as my colleagues and I talk about it, we always feel the same about it. We relieve this patient's suffering, and he died a peaceful death. And uh, as I think about it now, this has been, I guess, about 10 years ago, I think, Jerry, you're immortal because I'm telling your story and I'm giving people the feeling of what it's like to suffer and what we in medicine need to do about it. And I really think, and again today I express my thanks to Jerry for letting me tell your story again because it's a story of suffering that was relieved by medicine in a lawful manner and brings home the, the great principle that intention is what counts. Intention here to relieve suffering. So with that, I think I have, I think I have exhausted my time, but I want, I hope this has given you some feeling of what palliative care is all about, what we do in palliative care, what hopefully as the years go on, we'll do a great deal more and perhaps uh, putting Boomer and Frankel together will help us do a lot more. And um, so I send out these little thoughts, little ambassadors for giving, for, for gaining the knowledge and the feeling that can make our patients better, give our patients better care, but also add joy to our lives. And you can see in that, that palliative care, by giving good, good, by providing good control of symptoms, by good communication, by attention to good decision making, can provide a death that is peaceful and fulfilling, not only for the patient and family, but also for the physicians taking care of the patient. Thank you. Would you like to engage in any dialogue? <laughs> we have a couple of different questions if anyone has any questions. Yes, go ahead. Speak up. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other different, uh, any other experience with people like Arabs or Muslim or Chinese or from different uh, uh, cultural backgrounds that I'm sorry. Would you translate? Yes. The question is, do you have any experience with people from other backgrounds, like Arabs and Muslims, or could you speak? Oh, glad you brought that up because there, um, as part of palliative care, it's looking at other traditions, also other cultures, and um, I have a fantastic handout on palliative care in the Muslim patient. There, the communication. Probably, I'm not an authority on doing that, but communication is communication. No matter what the culture, no matter where you are, whether you're in China or whether you're in Iraq, or there is a way of dialogue, a way of interacting that is not necessarily spoken. And I think in medicine, we, we can actually, I can give you a small example of that, the way we look at a patient, the way we touch a patient, the way we turn a patient indicates to them whether or not we care for them. If that patient feels cared for and loved by even a simple gesture like that, that goes, that's global. That goes through the whole world. That's everywhere. Does that answer your question? It's not a very lengthy answer, but 
Any other questions? Mariana, I have a question. How do you how do you apply your own spirituality into sharing the patient's spirituality or into a, into practicing palliative care? Uh, oh, good, good. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I think it's important to know that our whatever our own spirituality is, we should not force upon a patient. I think that's part that's part of the spiritual assessment that where we are spiritually, and that is different for everyone, it is simply our concern. It is not, however, incumbent upon us to force another person to accept that kind of spirituality. And, and it may be entirely different. I learned it a lot over the years. But also, I, I think that uh, um, it, it is something that uh, in, in the beginning of hospice, we used to call for volunteers. And uh, there was just one, one hospice in 78, now they're 44 here in San Antonio. <laughs> but we used to ask people to come in and volunteer. We really had to screen them out because we had a lot of volunteers that came to save souls. Our mission is not to save a soul. Our mission is to respect the other, the patient's belief, whatever it is whether it's Muslim, whether, no matter what, whether it's atheist, whether it's, whether it's some people that, that won't even say there is something, it doesn't matter. It's the connection with human beings that is actually um, is spiritual, but even perhaps a dimension beyond spirituality. I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that because that does come up. And we had a lot of volunteers that didn't make it because they, uh, their their um, goal was different. Good question. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for your comments.